the baptism of Jesus and our own baptisms. So my sermon title this morning is Water in the Wilderness. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. There isn't universal accord on the etymology and the implications of the word honeymoon, but it likely refers to the first lunar month following a wedding. We use that word in a variety of settings, don't we? We talk about a honeymoon period and a new job. We talk about a honeymoon in relationship of relationships of all types, including a marriage. Merriam-Webster offers up a somewhat cynical implication that the word honeymoon comes from the reality that the first month of marriage is the sweetest. So you better enjoy it while you can. Well, after 34 years plus of marriage, I wouldn't abide by that contention. But I do understand the idea of savoring the good times when we have them. Because we all know that life doesn't always roll like a never-stop honeymoon. So a time when nothing will ever go wrong. And in fact, if we approach life thinking that things should always be perfect, and then we think of, pers- of obstacles as personal affronts, well, we're in for a tough go, aren't we? Because rough patches happen. And if we're ill-equipped to face them, it's going to be very hard to process those rough patches, let alone integrate them into our lives or even grow from them. We have made a transition in our church year from the Christmas season. We have our tree up one more Sunday to Epiphany. And it's marked by Epiphany, the Epiphany Day, which was on Friday, in which we remember that story from the second chapter of Matthew, where at Herod's behest, the Magi go to visit the baby Jesus. As that chapter goes on, we learn that Herod threatens to kill all the young children in and around Bethlehem, which causes the Holy Family to flee to Egypt before they finally settle by the end of chapter 2 in Nazareth. We learn nothing about Jesus' upbringing. So here we are in chapter 3, which begins with John the Baptist proclaiming the coming kingdom of God and calling us all to repent. And then we get to the 13th verse where we are today, and there's Jesus, fully grown, ready to be baptized. There's some deferential interaction, maybe you noticed, between John and Jesus. John thinks that he ought to be baptized by Jesus, but Jesus wants to respond to, wants to participate in this kingdom of God proclamation, and he wants to fulfill his purpose, so he insists to be baptized. Clearly, It's this moment for Jesus of affirmation and strengthening. It's like this seam that divides earthly experience and divine understanding. The seam loosens, and Jesus is able to have, here's the word, epiphany, a divine illumination where he sees God's Spirit coming down upon him, and he's reassured of God's love. God's presence, God's guidance in his life. For this stellar moment, Jesus knows who and whose he is. He's unequivocal that he has a special connection between himself and God, and that fuels his compulsion to fulfill all righteousness. And it's a good thing. Because you know what comes next? The very next verse, the temptation. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness 
where he is tempted with self-satisfaction, self-preservation, and self-aggrandizement. This is not peaceful, bucolic kind of wilderness. This is unfamiliar, hostile wilderness, where he begins by fasting. So when he finally encounters these temptations, he's famished and he's vulnerable. Oh, I know, it's Jesus, right? So he's stronger than temptation. He's able to prevail where we do not. He keeps his singular focus on his purpose, and he prevails. And I'll wager I know your first thought. Well, guess what? I'm not Jesus. I am not that good. Well, that may be true. But there's still a reason we follow this story. And I don't mean to just leave you unmoved because you're not Jesus or completely demoralized because you'll never measure up. Rather, I want us to focus on the sequence in the narrative. Baptism followed immediately by temptation. And this, my friends, this is supremely relevant to our lives because wilderness, you see, wilderness is all around us. Oh, you might be in a clearing right now with some smooth sailing, but there is hurt and there is confusion and there are famished spirits all around you. Think about what we've been reading that goes on in Turkey. Think of the tragedy after tragedy in Syria. Think of what happened in Fort Lauderdale. Think of Perrine and all the tensions in that community. Think about how in the Miami Herald we read at the end of 2016, the three hottest years on record all happened in this decade. So you're on a honeymoon? Good for you. Other people? And other situations are not. And at the risk of bursting your bubble while you're in that happy place, it can change in a moment. We know that. Calamities strike. Disappointments bring us down. There are random hardships. Tragedies befall us. The wilderness invades. And not to recognize that is naive and, quite frankly, unrealistic. It happened for Jesus. It happens for us. And that, my friends, that is why it is so significant, I believe, that we notice that before Jesus is thrust into the wilderness, before he is tempted and brought into confusion, why he is baptized. He is named and claimed and told that come what may, God will be with him. And to remember that that water comes with him into the wilderness is so very important for our lives. Do you see, we have in common those wilderness experiences with Jesus, but we also, as Christians, have baptism in common with Jesus. And that's a sacrament, a rite of such profound significance that we understand it as a means of grace. It's a vehicle through which God speaks to us and says, I love you. And I give you my life, my forgiveness, and my presence forever, and it's real. We do nothing to deserve this. And quite frankly, nothing is truly required of us. It is a definitive statement that God makes. Just like God said to Jesus, you are my child. And I love you forever. And absolutely, I think that statement compels us to be disciples of the risen Lord. But make no mistake, even if you don't, God's love doesn't stop. That's what makes it grace. And when you draw on that water, particularly when you're in the wilderness, 
Why you find strength and guidance and purpose and peace. I can think of countless examples. I'll begin with Martin Luther, who so often his spirit would flag and he would find his zeal ebbing as he would experience rejection, as he wanted to reform things in the church. And when he would get to his ebb, he would say, but I am baptized. And he would remember that there are resources beyond him that would fill him with strength. He knew through his baptism, that God was with him for the long haul. I think of a man who I was invited to see days before his death. I hadn't been invited into this situation for a long time. He and his family were in a dark, dark wilderness of disease. They had mounted an offensive, every viable treatment, a valiant and effective strategy for a while, but it would not prevail. The only enduring thing that could give them strength as it was clear that we were facing the end of life in the midst of that wilderness was to draw on the water of baptism. For me to proclaim to him and his family, you are God's child, you are loved, and nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ ever. So amidst the sadness of life ending, there was grief and there was triumph. I think of a family in a sea of confusion because of a delicate, significant surgery for a newborn daughter and granddaughter. I was called to come to the hospital to say a prayer, and I said, of course. Not 10 minutes later, I got another call. Could you come a little later? Because more family wants to gather. Of course that was okay, because I knew that they were all in the wilderness. They all didn't want to lose heart, and they all didn't want to lose their way. So we gathered, and we offered a prayer, and we lifted the things for which we were so very grateful in this situation, and we also lifted our fears, the things that threatened to undo us. And we prayed that Jesus, like a gentle shepherd, would lead us beside those still waters, those waters in the wilderness, so that we would experience calm, a quiet confidence to know that come what may, God would be with us in the darkness of that wilderness until we could see the light of God's face. Always. This is how we prayed, that we would be safe in God's arms no matter the outcome. And that is where we remain today. Baptism. It's not a shot. It's not an immunization that guarantees some kind of eternal honeymoon. It's water. It's water in the wilderness. It is a healing balm that reminds you that you are never, ever alone. You are always loved, always God's child, even when you forget it. You are forgiven, and you can proclaim, proclaim, I am baptized, and know that God is with you always. And so there is always reason to rejoice. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.